Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done, and... Well, we take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624, or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. Thanks. <laughs> My name is Noah Chalaya. <laughs> I'm your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off. See, that's what happens. I take off for, I take off for one week unexpectedly, albeit, and I forget how to push all the buttons. So good thing I have people surrounding me that catch it. Hey, you know, to, this week is an exciting week for those of us that uh, exist on the Linux platform. Guess, guess who's bringing their software to Linux? Well, that'd be Microsoft. Microsoft announced this week, well, today actually, that Edge is going to come to Linux. Now, we'll have a link for you in the show notes, and you'll be able to hear the presentation in all of its glory. But I want to play the relevant parts for you because, my gosh, if this isn't interesting, I want you to pay attention to a couple of things here. Microsoft is trying to position themselves to be more relevant. And so if you wake up in Microsoft's shoes and your boss tasks you with going into the technical community and coming back with something that can help Microsoft focus their direction on something that makes them more relevant to the technical community, what would you look at? Would uh, the, One of the things that confuses me about this entire decision, and don't get me wrong, I think this is great. I'm glad that we have one more piece of software on Linux. I'm glad that there are going to be some more options for us in the business workplace. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But I want you to pay attention. Any of you who have used Windows 10 and tried to open an alternative browser, you'll notice two things. First, the first thing that Microsoft does is when you open Edge, it gives you this message about Edge is faster and look at how much faster Edge is. And you would want to use Edge. Don't use Chromium. Don't use Chrome. Don't use Firefox. Use Edge. And the second thing that does is it makes it just unbearably difficult to change the default browser. You can't even do it inside the browser. You have to go into some cockamamie control panel and, and change some setting in there. And so as I was listening to this presentation today, I found it remarkably interesting that they first acknowledge that Internet Explorer and Edge is the laughing stock of the web browser neighborhood. And by their own graph, Opera, Chrome, and three other browsers, I, I assume Vivaldi, I don't even recognize the... Um, the icons have a higher score with HTML5 doc, uh, HTML5test.com than Microsoft's own browser. So they acknowledge that there has been a problem for a long time, despite the fact that they advertise the exact opposite in Windows 10. Now listen to this. So Chromium based, this is a HTML5test.com is, a, is a, a test that you can go and you can see the testing scores of the browser that you are in. And as you can see, the legacy edge scores at 4, 491, but Chromium based browsers are at 535. And so this test is based upon features, um, new standards that are implemented. And so as you can see, the new edge is now at the same level as other Chromium based browsers. The new Edge is fully cross-platform. We, we apparently, not everybody's on Windows 10. It's weird. So we wanted to go where the so customers weird. were. Yeah, so I know, weird. I, it was shocking. Shocking. So I, I, Windows 7, 8.1, 10, long-term servicing, branch of servicing channel, whatever you want to call it. Windows 10S, IoT Enterprise, Server 2008, R2 and above. And yes, you people still are on uh, Server 2008. Mac OS, um, release candidate available today, the release candidate for all those previews that we talked about. Android and iOS has been available for about two years. Hopefully you already knew that. And Linux is coming at a later time. Okay, so here's the important part. The important part is that they are going to release this software for Linux. And that is a benefit to us. As much as we like to poke fun at Microsoft, that is a benefit to us. But what's frustrating is, again, like I say, Every time I've had the unfortunate experience of using Windows 10, which I, I don't understand why they intentionally disconnect themselves from their customer base. So they're aware that Windows 10 is a joke and people aren't willing to use it and they had to essentially force people to upgrade to begin with. That doesn't stand out to, that doesn't stand out to Microsoft as a problem and that is concerning and frustrating to me. But nothing in the way of their actual decision here is all that terribly surprising, right? Consider this. The porting Chrome 
Or porting Edge to Linux now that it is based on the Chrome engine is a fairly straightforward task. And I think really the message to take away from Microsoft's decision here is it tells us a lot about choice in the Linux ecosystem. And it tells us why it's so difficult to get proprietary industry software to come to Linux. Now, listen, you have my ear. If you are sitting there and saying to yourself, Noah, I don't care if proprietary software comes to Linux. I don't care if industry standard software comes to Linux. I want the free and open source alternatives to become the industry standard. I get that. I understand what you're saying. I hear you. But consider the fact that Inkscape is a remarkable tool. Anybody who has used Inkscape finds that it is a very capable, professional, uh, scalable vector graphics tool. In fact, I have been in a couple of different graphic design shops. In fact, one of them is a client of ours. And I've had the opportunity to sit behind some of the graphic artists and watch them work in their software. Now, are they more talented than me? Yeah, by about a, by about a factor of a thousand, right? But at the same time, the actual steps that they go through, the tools that they use, are all perfectly capable to be done under Inkscape, and I do them all the time. In fact, there's been more than one occasion where I've been sitting in a crowd or sitting in a restaurant and somebody will say, oh, I really wish I could have this thing or extract that thing or convert this thing to that thing. Oh, one sec, let me see it. Hand it over, hand it over on a flash drive, fire up my laptop, fire up Inkscape, knock it out in a second. It's a very intuitive, very powerful, very professional program. And so I think there is a place to start moving open source alternatives into the professional workforce. But, and I've brought this example up before, I'll bring it up again because it's relevant here. The reason that everybody uses Microsoft Office today, the reason that Excel has become the standard for spreadsheets, and I hear people, even people who use LibreOffice Calc, they don't call them Calc spreadsheets, they still call them Excel spreadsheets, or just spreadsheets. The reason that they establish that dominance is because they first opened Lotus 123 format. They first were able to take all of those people in that entire ecosystem that existed on Lotus, and they enabled users to be able to use their software with their existing documents well. And in just a couple of short years, everybody went, well, Lotus, what's Lotus? I, I just use Excel. That's how you make change. You meet the users where they are. And that's the one thing she got right. Well, and the fact that they're releasing this for Linux. That's the one thing she got right is the fact that, and yes, I apologize. Uh, two bit in the chat room asks if uh, we're going to be on Mumble. Yes, we absolutely are. Again, I take a week off, I forget how to click all the buttons, so I apologize about that. She announces herself that this is the case. And so what, what I took away from this is it's really a, a conversation about choice. I'm a pragmatist. First, we have to be welcoming and provide a soft landing spot for companies and software developers to bring their existing models, models that they're comfortable with, models that they understand, models that they know how to license, models that they know how to sell, models that their board is comfortable with, models that their support infrastructure is comfortable We have to support that first. And then, and only then, after that is solidified, then we can make it to a point where we can start talking about the software license and trying to move people over. It did not take all but three minutes for this news to break on Reddit before the comments started coming in. Uh, nobody's going to use it anyway unless it's open source. Well, they're not going to release it for my distribution. Well, it's not going to be packaged this way. The survey that Microsoft sent out asked five questions. I'm dropping one because it's not relevant to my, top, my point. But the other four perfectly exemplify what I'm talking about here. This is a discussion about choice. And I've said it before, and I become more and more confident of this every single time we revisit this. I think there's too much choice on Linux. I think that I can defend that position fairly well. We have too much choice on Linux, and at the end of the day, we have gotten to a point where it's beginning to hurt us rather than help us. It helps those who have niche interests. It helps those who have niche choices, and that's great. But for mainstream people, people that just want to take a laptop, they want to open it up, they want to load an operating system, they want to run their software on it, it hurts those people. And I will explain to you why. The first question that Microsoft asked is, what distribution of Linux is most important for you for web development? And of course, of course, there is no great answer to that. There is no universal answer to what people who develop on Linux are going to choose as a distribution. Because even, first of all, you're going to get the people that some are going to say Arch, some are going to say Fedora, some are going to say Debian. 
And even if you can narrow it down to Ubuntu variants, you're still going to have a fracture when it relates to KDE or Xmonad or Gnome. You even still have some people that are hooked on Unity, right? There is so much choice and we become so adamant in our technical ability to defend our technical choice of desktop, of distribution, of, of, of packages. We're so sure of that and we're so confident that our way is the better way that it becomes a sport to debate the merits of Arch versus Ubuntu, of Fedora versus Debian, right? We talk about that for fun. We go out to Linux conferences and we go out for dinner and it's fun to talk about what the different distribution choices are. Can you imagine how frustrating that is to a multi-billion dollar company who is sitting there trying to figure out how they're going to provide a product to an end user and Linux is kind of this clump that they want to be in because that's where the developers are and at the same time they can't they can't approach them because it's so fractured. And no matter what decision they make, somebody is ready at the bit to complain about it. Somebody is ready to scold them for not doing it right. We are accustomed to a thousand different choices, six ways to Sunday. And when we don't get it, we complain up and down. Like I said, go over to r slash Linux, go look at the announcement, and then go look at the comments. It's, it, I mean, you're literally three comments in, and all of a sudden you, it starts, right? Nobody's going to use that. They didn't license it right. They didn't package it right. Second question. What scenarios do you primarily use web browsers for Linux? Let me give you the translation here. Here's what Microsoft's asking. Are you actually going to switch to Edge if we bother to port it over to Linux? Or are you all just going to use Chrome or Firefox anyway? Because that's what you're using now. And Microsoft is not so dumb as to think that there are people out there that are sitting around at their desk or waking up at night going, man, geez, I got access to Chrome and Firefox, but... If only I had access to Edge, what a great browsing experience that would be. Five times faster than Chrome, it said. Five times faster. Wish I had wish I had Edge on Linux. Man, I wish that was available to me. Nobody's saying that. People on Windows don't even use Edge, unless they have to. And so Microsoft is asking, would you even use it? To which I think the answer, resoundingly for the vast majority of us, is going to be no. I don't even use Chrome unless I absolutely have to, because I'm so sick and tired of the privacy um, invasions that occur. Right. And Firefox just keeps going ahead and ahead and ahead with all sorts of different features to to enhance your privacy. So, no, I'm not going to switch to to edge. However, and there is an upside to this, and I'll get to that in a moment. But again, Microsoft is asking people, is this even worth our time? And apparently they decided it must have been or they decided it's just such a trivial amount of work. They may as well try it. They ask if you used multiple distributions. For different scenarios versus, you know, web development versus personal work, et cetera, et cetera. Please specify which ones are important and to which it's scenarios, which I thought was a, I thought that was a good question because, for example, we standardize on Kubuntu, well, Ubuntu standard LTS for Alta Speed technology. So if you work here, that's what your work laptop will come with. And of course, you're welcome to load whatever Linux operating system you'd like to on it. Of course, you become responsible then for maintaining it, but that's kind of our quote unquote standard issue deployment, right? And there are plenty of people that work here that have a different distribution because they prefer it. And so they, I do one of two things. Either they just take on the responsibility of maintaining their personal distribution for work purposes, or a lot of them, what they do is they just do a boot the laptop and they have a one Linux partition for their personal stuff and an Ubuntu partition for work. So I thought it was a, a well thought out question. However, Back to the first one, right? There's no good answer to that. There's no good answer to what distribution should you expect to have to support because the answer you're going to get undoubtedly is going to be all of them. And if you don't support all of them, half the community is going to be upset with you because they didn't support their f chosen flavor. And they will be first to tell you why their chosen flavor is absolutely right and why everybody else who uses any other desktop distribution or any other desktop environment is wrong. How do you expect to install web browsers on your Linux devices? Man, if this is an appointed question and really underscores some of the problems we have in Linux, I don't know what is. Pay attention to this. Consider, consider what is involved for Edge, which is based on Chrome now, to be ported over to Linux. It's trivial at this point, right? They stripped out some of the Google Googleistic features and left, uh, you know, the, the the Chrome engine and then kind of branded it themselves. So we're not talking about anything crazy here. And yet they are concerned over what it's going to take to get people 
to move over. And I think that tells us a lot about them being worried about packaging and releasing. Because just like people will give you six different answers as to why you chose the wrong distribution, people are going to give you six to ten different answers as to why you packaged it wrong. Oh, I wanted it in a snap package. I wanted it in an app image. I just wanted the dev. I wanted the source code. I wanted an RPM. You, there's no good answer to that question. And until we start addressing some of these things, from the Linux community's perspective, we are going to have a very difficult time approaching companies the size of Microsoft to bring their products over. And I think it's good on Microsoft to take to, to wade into these waters because they're about to find out firsthand how unappreciative some people can be. And this will give us a real insight as to how serious their commitment to Linux is. As always, your phone calls go to the front of the line, 855-450-NO. That's 855-450-6624. Chaz, you're on Ask Noah. Good evening. How did you know that? How did I know what? That it was me calling. Oh, because you've called enough times. I know your number now. Uh, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. It just means you're a valuable part of the program, Chess. Uh, that's good to know. Anyway, um, I had sort of a follow-up to uh, the FFmpeg script you turned me on to. Uh, oh, sure. To go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the first pass seems to run fine, at least as far as I can tell. Okay. Um, when I run... When I run the second pass, and I've tried this on both Manjaro and Ubuntu, I get uh, a terminal output stating unknown encoder lib FDK AAC. Mm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just I figure out what needs to be added to my system in order to get it to encode. Yeah, I can. we can change that. You can You can just use a different encoder. I will uh, I'll, I, I will send you a modified version. We'll, we'll do try two tonight. And if that doesn't work, what I'll do is I'll, uh, well, I'll actually, I'll give you a free, uh, a free ticket at UltraSpeed and get somebody to work with you to, 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 to get that sorted out. But I, I, I think we can just swap out that encoder and that will fix your problem. Sounds good. I'll try it as soon as I get home from work and away from these dirty Windows 10 computers. <laughs> All right. Well, you have a great rest of your evening. You too. Thanks for calling, Jazz. 855-450. No, it's 855-450-6624. The email live at com. You too can be a part of the program. Add your voice to the conversation. Microsoft is worried about packaging, and they should be. Again, just like we defend our choice for distribution, just like we defend our choice for desktop environment, we defend our choice for packaging. And this is something that I think causes a lot more problems in the Linux ecosystem than most people give it credit for. I remember when Lightworks first came to Linux. I was ecstatic that Lightworks was coming to Linux. I had used Lightworks before. I had tried it. I thought it was a very capable professional editor. At the time, they had promised that they were eventually going to open source it. And so I thought we're finally going to have a pro-grade video editing system, open source, uh, top to bottom that runs on Linux it was pretty much the best news. The biggest news I personally had seen on Linux in probably 10 years. And that dream didn't really ever live up, right? Because eventually edit shared backed off on their word to, to open source. It. And so it's still great editing software. It's just great editing software that I'm locked in to a proprietary company. So I'm, I'm always kind of have half my eye on something else. I'm not fully committed to it, but it's great software. It does a really good professional job. And I remember when they first made that announcement and I went on the forums and I had signed up for an account and I was browsing around there and I wanted to get an idea of if there were other people that were as excited as I was that we were going to have a professional video editor on Linux. And I was shocked that every post was not excitement, was not gratitude, was not uh, you know, elation of, hey, finally we have this tool that we've needed for so long. It's, oh, if they don't release it for Fedora, I'm not using it. I'm like, what are you talking about? I use Fedora as my primary operating system, and I'm perfectly willing to hack the dev together to get it to run on Fedora. I'm perfectly willing to do that. The fact that they're releasing the software at all is massive. In fact, if I have to dual boot my computer to Ubuntu and Fedora, even that's acceptable because, hey, we have professional grade video, edit video editing on Linux. And nobody cared. Nobody cared. People were so upset with EditShare because they didn't license it right. And they had activation and they had a subscription model and like you name it. And their entire company model was picked apart top to bottom just because they offered to port their software to Linux. It was embarrassing. It was embarrassing to be a Linux user. And 
as I watch this conversation unfold on Reddit about Microsoft Edge, I can't help but think the same thing. It becomes embarrassing that we don't get it. And I, I just, I want to do my part. Listen, if you're a person that uses open source software top to bottom, it becomes trivial, again, to use it on various different desktop environments and use it in various different distributions because there's always one other person that's also passionate about FOSS and they will port that software as long as they have access to the source code to whatever distribution you want to use. Some some other Fedora user out there is porting the software that was originally written for Ubuntu to Fedora. Some Arch guy, but long before the Fedora guy probably even released the RPM, probably had that source code uploaded into the AUR. AUR let's just be honest, right? It, the second an idea is born, it practically goes into the AUR. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's there. There's always somebody passionate to do that. That becomes not just difficult, almost impossible when it comes to proprietary software. And you can take the hard line in the sand and say, listen, I'm just not using proprietary software. It's fine. But just understand that the vast majority of large companies manufacture proprietary software. And the vast majority of the world, although this is changing, runs on proprietary software. Few things here. I think that Microsoft is mostly interested in developers. And you can tell that based on the way that they've worded these questions, right? Which distro would you use for web development? They know that web devs are often on Linux and they want them to use Edge. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if this is an effective strategy or not. I don't understand what the compelling advantage to use Edge is when it's based on Chromium. It seems that there are no selling benefits. And Chatroom, please point this out if I'm wrong. I don't understand where the upside, if I'm already using Chrome, is to switch over to Edge. And Microsoft, in doing this, in rebasing Edge to the Chrome engine, essentially handed the web to Google. I don't particularly care for Google or Microsoft. But I'll tell you what, competition of evil is better than no competition for evil. And they effectively just handed Google the whole the, the baby and the bathwater. And if I were Microsoft and I'd given up on trying to establish dominance in the web browser, I'm not sure why they think that's something that they need to be in. It doesn't seem like it particularly is advantageous for them for Azure. They could just as easy package Chrome or a Chrome alternative like Chromium, a true open source browser. I don't know. I really don't understand what the advantage is for people using Edge. It doesn't give them any amount of control. They can't charge for anything. I guess the only thing is their icon is the one that's open and minimized in the taskbar rather than Google's. I'm not sure. But they still, for the time being, have a dominance on the desktop operating system, and it seems like they are not paying attention to it. We'll get to that in a moment, but as always, your calls go to the front of the line, 855-450-NOAA. You are, oops, I gotta click the button. Man, I really am out of uh, out of the swing of things. You're on Ask Noah. Good evening. Hey, Noah. Know, so what do you think the res about a response to Microsoft about if you're trying to target developers, pointing out to them that if they were to open source it, it would allow those same developers to not only help them with their own code, but also to port it to other distros that they aren't porting it to. Can you imagine if Microsoft open to, to open sourced the Edge browser and instead of just, just uploading it onto GitHub, which they own, imagine if they uploaded it onto GitHub and offered bounties for the various different um, you know, software bugs and, and programs that were out there. Instead of hiring internal developers to do it, just imagine if a company with Microsoft scale uh, said, hey, here's an open source project. We're just going to fund the thing. If you have a passion to develop web browsers, come, to, come, come hack on Edge and we'll just pay you to do it. Here are the problems. Users can submit problems that they have. If you fix that problem, we pay you X amount of dollars for fixing that problem for us and handling it. Imagine how fast Edge would rise to prominence. Imagine how fast Edge would get accepted into the open source community. Microsoft takes their billions of dollars and fights against Google's billions of dollars and says, hey, we are going to rebrand ourselves and we are going to care about privacy. So we stripped out all of Google's crap. We still made it just as fast as Google because based on the same engine and we're going to get a, go ahead and open source that so that everybody can verify that. Imagine how fast that would become the most popular browser in use today. Yeah, that, that would be amazing. Um, the other question I had is if Microsoft is rebasing on the Chromium web engine, um, how much 
would Firefox be losing if they were to keep all of their privacy but rebase their rendering engine around the same one? We would essentially get one rendering engine across all web browsers at that point. That's true. I, I, I actually, when, when, when they first announced, when Microsoft first announced this, I actually, I asked a very similar question. I said, how long before, my, before Firefox just gives in on their, on their engine? But, you know, what Firefox has done it recently, and it hasn't gone unnoticed by myself or other people in the Linux community, is they kind of dug their heels in and said, that's great. Go ahead, Google. You go ahead and take 85% of the market share because that's what it'll be now when you combine Internet Explorer and Chrome into one. So Firefox is Firefox and everything else uh, is divided among the remaining like 15%. But here's the thing. They kind of dug their heels in the containerization for Facebook, the uh, the the limit of ad tracking, the built in VPN functionality or proxy functionality that Firefox is, has has. They also have a substantial amount of um I guess geek cred, for lack of a better terminology, uh, with with the Tor project, right? And if you want a privacy focused, secure web web browser, even though everybody that's on the Tor project will tell you that Chrome tends to respond a little bit faster, people are still using Firefox because of its privacy features. So I, I think I think Mozilla is doing a great job of actually providing a brand differentiation and saying, here's why you should use our engine in our browser. Now, could they do those same privacy features and base it on the Chrome engine? They probably could. Um, I suspect that they just have their own path and their own ideas of how to create a second engine. And frankly, as a person who has used Chrome and Firefox, I don't notice enough of a speed difference that I ever mind using Firefox. I just appreciate all of the privacy advantages. Yeah, I just wonder if we're going to hit a point where there's a lot of sites out there where, you know, back in the day it was, oh, you need IE6 compatibility. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we're going to hit a point where it's, you need, you know, Chrome compatibility. Yes. Well, we already have that, right? Uh In fact, one of the the pieces of software we use here at the studio called Source Connect is a web-based, WebRTC-based... I don't know, communication client, I guess. it's it, Essentially, it's like a phone call, except it provides very high bandwidth, uh, very high quality, low latency audio. And that uh, service only works with a Chrome-based browser. You can't use Firefox. And I, I have guest after guest that, you know, we have a lot of people on here that really have a lot of uh, respect their privacy and care about their privacy. And when I when I tell them, hey, this is the software that we use to connect, they go, and only runs in Chrome. I, go, yeah, I know, it's a pain, but that's that's kind of what we're... So we're already seeing that. Um, and you you kind of touch on a point I was going to get to here in a moment, which is that this is going to sort of level the playing field for us on the Linux desktop, because you're right. These companies are going to mandate that you have the latest version of Edge, but now we can have the latest version of Edge. Yeah, I just I worry that um, with the Chrome rendering engine taking over, that it's going to eat the web. Oh, I do too. And Firefox is going to be left out. <laughs> best case scenario. Now, what do you? Th- best case scenario is eighty-five percent of the web is concentrated on the Chrome engine, and fifteen percent of the web is concentrated on Firefox, and that assumes that we stomp out Opera and Vivaldi and all those other ones, right? Best case scenario is that is is Chrome is going to own eighty-five percent of the web starting when this edge or chrome based edge is released in fact i think it's already out but you know as it releases for all platforms yeah the other thing too is in relation to your uh one of your first comp, uh points was that everybody's complaining that you know you didn't package it my way or for my distro or whatever rather than having people complain at microsoft wouldn't it be more beneficial to go to them and go look you know if you package it for ubuntu that's going to cover, you know, the majority of desktop users, as much as I hate to say it. Um, and if you package it in a snap, that'll cover the rest. And that's not preferred, but, you know, that'll help. <laughs> right. right. And I, I think I, I would imagine if, my, if I woke up in Microsoft's shoes, I would say, let's package it as, as a snap and let's let Canonicals deal with getting the snaps into Fedora and Red Hat and Arch and all the other places, right? Because we can do that. We as a Linux community can do that. We can get SnapD to run on other distributions, and then we can get the, that software. We have to centralize around some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of software installation because, frankly, it's just unreasonable to expect companies like Adobe, Microsoft, so on and so forth, to expend time. Uh, releasing software and packaging software for our chosen flavor of whatever. 
And I think the so I think the answer to that, the technology exists to solve that problem. We just don't want to agree on flat packs, app image, or snaps. We want everybody who has their own idea and their own spin and their own political reasoning as to why the you can't use this one, you gotta use that one. And I I think we would do well to just say you know, for me, I've kind of looked at all of them. I've tried them all. I happen to like snaps. I think that the central repository is a great idea. I like the fact mostly that I can just install SnapD, and for the most part, uh, any snap package runs on there. The thing that drives it home for me is not the technology. It's the company behind it. Canonical does a fantastic job of sending people out, flying people to Microsoft to say, hey, we would like Skype to be available on Linux. Let us help you show you how easy it is to package Skype up in a snap package and have it available. And thus, 24 hours later, we have a snap package of Skype for Linux. That happens because Canonical spends their money to make those things happen. And that kind of outreach is way more important to me than the technical advantages of app image and or flat pack and or whatever the other thing is, right? That kind of outreach and that kind of dedication and that kind of commitment and that kind of out, those are the things I think that are really going to make Snaps a successful platform for software deployment. Yeah, my other, my biggest concern with Snaps, however, is the fact that if my, if uh, Canonical does go public, then what are the shareholders going to do with that? Are they going to stop, you know, is there going to be something there that becomes a detriment if everything's based on snaps and now, oh, no, we got to change? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the danger there is not necessarily with the snap packages themselves. The danger is with the snap store. The snap store is holistically exactly. and completely controlled by Canonical. And so you would have to. And the, the thing is, I and again, I, I'm not trying to pick on these people, but I, I have seen in in various different chat groups where somebody from Canonical will somebody will say make a, make a reference to the fact that uh, the that the Canonical controls the Snap Store, and there'll be people from Canonical or associated with Canonical that will say, "Well, do you want to know why that is?" Well, just tell me why that is. If the if the answer is so, just tell me. Just say, "Here's why we do it." But it, no matter what the answer is, the reality is they still control that card deck, and so we would have to spin up a you know a snap store essentially from scratch if that were to happen. But if you know what, if we could get everybody on the same packaging system, I'm willing to deal with that problem down the road. I'm willing to deal with the fact that the place that we download the snaps from might have to change or might need some work. We can figure that part out. Let's just get everybody on the same thing to begin with. Yeah, well, I just hope it goes well. Now, you had mentioned them, uh, Microsoft ripping the uh, tracking and privacy invasion out of the Chromium br uh, browser to base it, rebase on uh, for Edge. Yeah, no promises. They're not going to put their own in there. Back, I was just going to say, with Microsoft loving all their telemetry and all of that, do you think that they're going to load their own in? Or is that yet to be seen? I, I haven't seen anything that indicates one way or the other. Windows 10 has enough telemetry that if I were a betting man, I would tell you that they probably have all of the information they need from the underlying operating system themselves. And the fact that they own 80 plus percent of the desktop operating system means there's not a lot of it. There's not a lot of benefit to them adding telemetry back into the browser itself. But I wouldn't necessarily put it past them. Either way, either way, no matter what they do, they are differentiating themselves we're trying to make it, you know, let's take worst case scenario. Let's say Microsoft reintroduces their own telemetry into Edge. At least we're still at a point where Google has some of the information and Microsoft Soft has some of the information and one company doesn't have all of it. It's not much of a win, but it is a win. Yeah. If I were to guess, I would say Microsoft will probably leave that out. And because it's not, you know, they, they'll collect the information from Windows 10 and they'll leave the Mac OS users and Linux users and the, you know, whatever that slide had, the other 17 umpteen million operating systems that they're going to try and support with Edge. They'll leave all those out. Yeah, my biggest concern is that they're going to do what they did when Windows 10 first came out. And they were, uh, when Windows 10 first came out, they did not have a whole lot of telemetry and tracking and everything else. And then I forget exactly, but a few months later, they swapped out the EULA out from under and pushed the, all the telemetry in. Oh, yeah. So it, it, and it, let me tell you, they ripping, do something like that. It, ripping that stuff out, man, is a royal pain in the tuckus. I mean, it really, actually, <laughs> Kabavik in the chat room says, our IT department has a ridiculously difficult time turning off all of the Windows 10 telemetry. I mean, it's, it's literally short of spyware is what it is. Um, and that's super frustrating. Right. 
And, and that's one reason why when Microsoft says, oh, you know, we heart Linux and we heart privacy, I go, well, then give me one big button that I can smash that turns off all the telemetry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, you're absolutely. And, Good. And the other thing, too, is I don't understand how they're expecting Windows 10 to be implemented into medical environments, into DOD environments. Mm -hmm. All of these have heavy restrictions on what data can be, you know, exfilled, essentially. Mm -hmm. Well, And that's exactly what the telemetry is doing. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And I, I thank you very much for the call. Part of that is they actually release special versions for uh, government, right? So one of the things that I, when when I worked as a when I when I have contract jobs, I one of the things that they do is they have uh, versions that have uh, like, for example, all of the Easter eggs are removed because they can't have undocumented code um, that's running on the op on the on on the government machines. And so they 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 when it comes into secured environments, they do deal with that uh, to a certain extent. I'm not sure if that necessarily applies into things like hospitals, but uh, certainly it is a it's a it's a scary proposition. If I were Microsoft, I would give up on this idea of establishing dominance on the web browser. I just don't understand what it's getting them. Um, their venture into mobile has been nothing but an abject failure. They, it, it, the, from, the, from where I sit, they have two possible paths forward. The first is the business environment. People in business love Microsoft because Microsoft is a large business. And other and they their entire infrastructure and ecosystem has been and continues to be built around businesses, Right. Anybody that's ever opened up a Apple computer and went to sign up and realized that you have to create some online account and click through 17 umpteen billion steps to get the machine to actually get you to a desktop realizes what a pain that is. And on, even on Windows 10, as much as I don't like it, you hold it, you hold the key combination down, it boots right in and you can join the domain and skip all the rest of the setup, right? If you have... 5,000 machines, to, well, if you have 5,000 machines to set up, you're, you're imaging. But if you've got 25 machines to set up and you don't have access to imaging software and you, the ability to just tell the computer, hey, skip all the normal stuff you're doing, join the domain, and I will push down what I want you to have. That is hugely beneficial to businesses because they're going to follow what Microsoft does. And that includes if Microsoft moves to the cloud with Azure. As Microsoft moves to the cloud with Azure, businesses are going to follow. And so they're, they, they are burning that currency for desktop dominance because businesses, at least today, still use computers. Now, it's becoming more difficult, as, as my last caller has pointed out and the chat room continues to point out, as Windows 10 becomes more and more of an abysmal failure and it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to disable updates, becomes difficult, if not impossible, to di disable the telemetry, what you wind up with is missionaries that travel overseas and burn through their entire budget in data alone because a Windows 10 machine updated without letting them know. What you find is a radio station that I work with that, ha that spent four some million dollars on a studio can't run Windows 10 in it because the machines randomly update and take the radio station off the air. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And that's the kind of thing that is going to keep Microsoft from, it's going to continue to pull them back because you're going to get, there's new POS systems that are running on iPads and on Android. There are, you know, you spoke about healthcare, whether we like it or not, and whether we think it's a secure environment or not, healthcare is largely moving towards Android devices and uh, the Zebra barcode scanner slash PDA devices. And they're using those. And if they would fix these blunders on Windows 10, like restarting randomly and you can't create shortcuts from a search in the start menu, and they would stop deprecating their own operating system about the same time that everybody adopts it for crying out loud. Do you know when we moved over to Windows 7? About the time that everybody was finally settled on XP. And do you know when we're going to, because Vista was a joke. Do you know when we're going to, when people are, there's going to be a big push to move people over to Windows 10? Beginning of next year when they're going to EOL Windows 7, about the time that everybody has settled on Windows 7. So they lay the ground, they get everybody on the ground, then they rip the cart out from under them, and then they wonder why they are having a difficult time sustaining a customer base. Stop deprecating your own OS about the time everybody gets on it. Their only interest in a browser is... Com it, it, Companies typically are moving away from OS requirements, and they are moving more towards software requirements. And I have seen this just in the last five years. I rarely see these days a Pentium, you know, well, <laughs> Pentium, a Intel Core 5, i5. That's how long it's been, though, since I've seen a processor recommendation, right? Intel i5 required with uh, Microsoft Windows or compatible software, blah, blah, blah. You don't see that anymore, right? Now you see 
if it's a really old version or if it's running some sort of ancient plugin ActiveX crap, it you will say something like requires IE8 and or they'll say something like Edge. Now, when you work in larger businesses or large corporations, they actually have agreements with Microsoft to continue to update and provide these ridiculously old versions of things like IE8, for example. And we have a customer that has a, a large contract with Oracle and um, Oracle has a special version of IE8 that they get from Microsoft that we can use to install to run. So these companies are, software companies are moving more towards actual software requirement. And the good news for Linux is because at the end of the day, these companies are going to start supporting Linux, not because they necessarily want to, or they have any interest in open source, or they even have even necessarily heard of Linux, but because we can now fundamentally run the same software as the Windows guys. That is a big deal. And there is absolutely going to be a time where we are going to see the year of the Linux desktop. It's just not going to come about the same way that we had imagined. We're going to be an operating system agnostic society. And frankly, to, not to mix words here, but people are too stupid to use computers. All The vast majority of people you run into in your day-to-day -day life are too dumb to use a regular computer, and they need everything dumbed down for them, and that's why phones and tablets have become so popular. Partly because they can just go everywhere, partly because they're fashionable and they're marketed such, but most users are too lazy or too dumb to figure out how to actually download and install software. In fact, so much so that in 2019, I can't count the number of times that I hear downloading and installing software referred to as sideloading. Sideloading, as if it's some sort of magical incantation spell that you do to, to sneak software onto a device you paid for. It's ridiculous. Half the people, actually probably more than that, like 90% of people out there, and I just made that statistic up, are running around with devices that they don't have administrative access to. It's absolutely mind-boggling to me. So I don't know what Microsoft's motivation is in all of this. I don't know what they hope to get out of it. I really strongly doubt the developer force is going to all of a sudden flock over to Microsoft Edge simply because it's released for Linux. However, I'll tell you this. Two things are, are very clear to me. First... I really do believe that this brings us one step closer to the Linux desktop because now all of these services, which are more and more basing themselves on web-based services, they, they typically divide into Internet Explorer and Chrome. I've yet to see a, soft, a site that only supports WebKit, you know, only runs on Safari. I've yet to see a site that only runs in Firefox. But I see plenty of sites that only run in Chrome, and I see plenty of sites that only run in Internet Explorer and or Edge. And any of the Internet Explorer sites are eventually going to get moved to Edge, and now we have Edge on Linux. So the, the path looks fantastic for us as far as if you want to run Linux on your day-to-day -day desktop. Think about it. Office 365, any shortcomings that were there before, and there weren't many, are all going to get solved because we're all going to be using the same web browser if we want to. Now... As a Reddit user pointed out, first time that password prompt comes up, I'm closing Edge, but hey, is what it is. Spent way more time on that story than I had intended to, but it is an important thing, and I think it has major ramifications and does give us all something to think about. You know what else gives us something to think about? The Pinebook Pro for sale for $199. The newest date has been released. It's November 6th. Actually, to be perfectly honest with you, they are accepting orders right here and now because guess what? About 10 minutes before I started the show, I ordered mine. So I have a Pinebook Pro on the way. I'm going to check it out. I I can't I cannot express. I cannot put into words the amount of ex, uh, of respect I have for this uh, for for this group. They do such a fantastic job of communicating with their customers and producing products that are of such high value that we can't I can't help but gush over them. The new Pinebook Pro it has the choice of the ANSI or ISO keyboards, and so that's good because it's going to give us a true American layout. Unlike the regular laptops, the Pinebook uh, and Pinebook Pro are not produced in mass. It's not some uh, you know a big lot that is that that just shows up and then they store them and they ship them when people order them. They're produced in batches. And so as long as people continue to buy them, they continue to make them. And so that's really great. Um, again, their communication, absolutely outstanding and fantastic. Um, they wrote today with their update and said, their Monster Cluster's core community services will migrate onto their own hardware in 2020. Pinebook Pros have shipped. The last pre-orders for the last three months will start today. Um, they're aware of the NVMe adapter and trackpack issues, and they're going to have a fix out for that soon. OG Pinebook upgrade to Pro is set up for Q1 of 2020. The Pinebook or the Pine Phone, rather, for developers will finally ship November 
25th through the 18th, the Pinephone Braveheart will start pre-orders November 15th, and they'll seek to make delivery on December of 2019 or January 2020. The Pine Tab uh, production conundrum state of software and the Pine Time dev kits have shipped and the development proceeding exceptionally well. And I would love to get my hands on a Pine Time, if nothing else for my son, because he wants a Pine Time. So once again, absolutely fantastic communication. And I'm super excited to get my hands on a Pinebook Pro. I was very, I was blown away by the quality I got from the regular Pinebook. I can only imagine uh, what they're going to be able to do with the Pinebook Pro. And the idea of having a small arm-based laptop that I that's inexpensive uh, that I can just pull out of the bag and I don't have to worry about bouncing my you know $1,500 ThinkPad around. I just take it out and use it. That's going to be something else. And the ability to be able to buy a few of them, to leave them in different places and have computers available where fundamentally I wouldn't be able to afford to have computers available is exciting. And the ability that what, what can be done from a generosity standpoint, you know, if you, you know, I have thought for so long about being able to go into a school system and teach kids how to do Python and programming and stuff like that. I think that is such a powerful uh, skill to have and such a cool way to express oneself through the art of software development rather than uh, playing you know, computer games and, and rather than just sitting back and watching movies on YouTube and Netflix. I think it's a much more interactive, uh, much more healthy way to experience and explore technology. Um, and when you're actually writing the code, it forces you to think about how the computer works. And I think that's beneficial to young people. Up until recently, up until the next last five, six years, it's not really been financially feasible, right? You're talking about a few thousand dollars worth of hardware, even with the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, the Raspberry Pi is, you know, 35 bucks, but then you got to buy a memory card. That's another 25. Then you got to buy a power supply. That's another 15. You got to buy a case. That's another 10. You got to buy a monitor. That's another hundred something. You got to buy a keyboard and mouse. That's another 35 bucks. I mean, by the time you're done, you're a couple hundred bucks into this, you know, inexpensive computer. Um, and then it's an inexpensive computer that you have to flash an operating system onto. And let's face it, SD cards are not always known for their reliability. And so they're in lots of problem. In fact, right now I have the clock that runs our studio and it's sitting in my hand because it, it died over, as I was gone. Um, this is a game changer for that because it's going to fundamentally allow me to buy, you know, five, 10 of these things and be able to take them to things like conferences, take them to things like schools, take them to things like outreach and uh, take them to things like my lug, uh, take them to things like a mall uh, display where we can set up and, and demonstrate Linux and the power of Linux. And it's a well-made machine and something that anybody, for the most part, uh, can purchase. Um, and so I think that's really great. And I, I think, you know, the Pinebook people continue to do a fantastic job. One other thing I want to touch on uh, is Fedora 31 is here. And so if you haven't used Fedora, you have to check it out. The Fedora Toolbox um, is a tool for launching and managing personal workspace containers. And so you can do development, you can experiment in an isolated uh, experience. Uh, we talked last week about Cubes. If you're not familiar with Cubes OS, it is an operating system that does everything inside of VMs. And so you open a file manager and it opens the file manager cube or the file manager VM uh, little container. Uh, it's not, I guess, eh, VM, I guess. It opens that container and allows you to work inside of it. That's pretty cool. And so this kind of thing is taking off. Obviously, Fedora Workstation is focusing on the desktop, in particular software developers who just want a Linux distribution that works out of the box. I would equate it to their answer to the LTS of, of Ubuntu. Um, this release is going to feature GNOME.3.34, which has significant performance improvements, um, and that'll be particularly noticeable on lower powered hardware. So you will definitely want to check out Fedora 31. I have it downloaded, and I have not installed it yet. My rule of thumb, uh, I typically wait a few weeks before I actually upgrade my Fedora box. I have used Fedora, uh, every version since Fedora Core 1, and I will continue, I'll definitely be upgrading Fedora 31. I just give it a couple weeks and all the kinks worked out, and then it, uh, and then it seems to work really fantastic. So, uh, check out Fedora 31. We'll have a link in the show notes. And finally, I wanted to uh, mention real briefly a script that I was working on. I, I got a, or a software package that I, I've modified into a script. I, I got a piece of feedback and the feedback says, Hey Noah, love the show. Last week you had an interesting conversation with a caller in which you described how Ross Albrecht was tricked into his laptop being stolen by the FBI to obtain it unencrypted. Is there anything that could be done to protect against this kind of attack? Perhaps store everything on an encrypted partition or maybe use Veracrypt? Thanks, Tom. 
So I did a little bit of digging on exactly what went on in the Ross Albrecht case and essentially what it was. Two FBI agents caused a commotion. A One of the FBI agents was seated across the table and as he looked up to see what the commotion was, they simply slid the laptop away from him and another FBI agent grabbed him from behind and then he was unable to shut the lid and they were able to access all of his stuff and retrieve his passwords out of the memory. Um, what can be done about that? The problem is it essentially is the same thing as a cold boot attack. Anytime the anytime the machine is running, the, the, the keys are stored in memory. And so you attack the machine um, by dumping the contents in the memory. And what a cold boot attack technically is, is when the machine is, even when it's powered off, you've got about five minutes before the contents of the RAM are actually lost. And so if you can get, if you can, uh, if you can spray it with uh, an upside down air can uh, and, and keep, and get the RAM into a machine loaded into a machine that you can dump the contents within about five minutes, you can usually dump the majority of the contents. And uh, the first thing I did was I found a project called USB Kill. And we'll have a link in the show notes to the GitHub page. And what USB Kill does is it monitors a given USB device that you have in the computer. And if you remove the USB device, what it does is it goes through and, and runs a Python script that, uh, that wipes the memory. Now, that's one way you can do it. I wasn't overly thrilled with that idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, I have to rely on Python, which I don't like. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with Python. It's just what I'm dealing with potentially trying to thwart somebody stealing my laptop and steal my encryption keys. I'd rather not rely on a Python script written by somebody. Second of all, if there are any exploitations in that script alone, that script has to continually run it as roots. So you better be darn sure that the code is sound, and I'm not real comfortable with that. So I did a little bit of digging into the way that Tails does their memory wipe, and Tails has, I think, a much better way. And the way that Tails does it is this. They use the kernel's built-in memory poisoning feature, which basically anytime memory is freed up, the kernel itself will automatically start overwriting the memory so that it can't be filled with any useful data. Of course, this only works if the memory is actually freed up. So Tails, instead of concentrating on actually wiping the memory, focuses on just killing all the processes all the time. And it just, it kills the desktop, it kills the, the, the login manager, it just kills everything as fast and as harshly as possible, just guts the system and frees up all of the memory and then lets the kernel continue to run and just let the kernel handle dumping the memory. So I have, I'm working on trying to get together with a, a script that I can, I can hotkey or tie to my power button or whatever that I can run. And it will do exactly what tails does, which is dump all of my processes. And you just focus on getting all the processes cleared up and let's let the kernel handle wiping the memory. I like that approach much better. And so I, I I'm working on it. I, I haven't got it done. I will have a link to the USB kill script. If you want something in the meantime, I'm just telling you it comes with the, uh, with the Noah word of caution, that's that's why I'm not uh, I'm not super into it. I got another piece of feedback. I'm not sure if I have enough time to get through it in its entirety, but we're going to give it a shot. It says, uh, hi, Noah. I just wanted to say thank you for the best episode of Ask Noah I've ever heard. Permanent Record Part 2 resonated with me on so many frequencies. Uh, and then he goes on to... Um, to uh, to give some compliments on 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 our uh, expertise on security and so on and so forth, but he says uh, after listening to the audiobook, he's been considering configuring a spare Raspberry Pi on his trusted LAN to act as a Tor gateway using a transparent Torification as described here. And then he links into the Arch Wiki. I would then install an Open VPN server on the Raspberry Pi so that it will only connect to the VPN whilst on my local network. And at times I can quote unquote go dark. My thought is that there is traffic that will be encrypted in the VPN, preventing, preventing eavesdropping from within my LAN and will exit the Tor LAN with an encrypted, uh, obfuscated, and secure channel through Tor. Uh, this limits to TCP traffic, and I trust it will be more than something NordVPN. Anyway, my main point here is that I appreciate everything you do for the community. Thanks again, Matthew. So, um, yes, in theory, your plan should work. In theory, you should be able to set up a Tor uh, gateway inside of your home, and then you should be able to VPN into it, and then, in theory, all of your traffic will go through the VPN and then exit. One of the reasons that people like me use Tor, in fact, one of the reasons that people like me use Tails instead of just Tor is because VPNs notoriously have uh, problems from time to time. The VPN drops, it leaks your IP address. Uh, it's just not a foolproof method. VPNs were really designed to provide a secure way in to a business network. They were never really designed um, to as a privacy functionality, that's just kind of something that we've hacked on afterwards. And so 
the safest thing to do would be to use something like a Tails distribution uh, that you boot in and and then run Tor from from that. the The browser is going to be locked down. It's it's configured with a ton of add-ons uh, like NoScript and 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 so on and so forth that forces HTTPS connections. Because remember, any t traffic that exits a Tor network is coming out of an exit node, and that traffic by its very nature has to be unencrypted. So if you don't use end-to-end -end encryption, if you're not using SSL or you're not using your own encryption method to get your traffic, you know, if it's SSH or whatever, outside of that exit node, whoever is running that exit node can sniff all that traffic. So if you connect to an FTP server, yeah, it'll be encrypted all the way through the Tor network, but as soon as it hits that exit node, it's unencrypted. And so for all of those reasons, I would, uh, I would, <laughs> if you're not doing anything terribly dangerous, I guess it's probably okay to VPN into a Tor uh, gateway. I would probably stick to using something like Tails. Plus, if your machine ever does get infected, your host, if you're if it's your actual machine, if you're using something like Tails, every time you reboot the system, it's a brand new show. Hey guys, thanks for joining. I apologize for not being here last week. I had some personal things I had to uh, to address, but they're all squared away. And so the Ask Noah Show is back. We'll of course be back next Tuesday, 6 p.m. Central, at AskNoahShow.com. We'll see you then. <laughs>